Agatha Christie, Miss Marple. Short Stories Sanctuary The End of Short Stories of Miss Marple Thanks for listening and watching. Tell it you me trademark 2020. Sanctuary The vicar's wife came round the corner of the vicarage with her arms full of chrysanthemums. A good deal of rich garden soil was attached to her strong brogue shoes and a few fragments of earth were adhering to her nose, but of that fact she was perfectly unconscious. She had a slight struggle in opening the vicarage gate which hung, rustily, half off its hinges. A puff of wind caught at her battered felt hat, causing it to sit even more rakishly than it had done before. Bother, said Bunch. Christened by her optimistic parents Diana, Mrs. Harmon had become Bunch at an early age for somewhat obvious reasons and the name had stuck to her ever since. Clutching the chrysanthemums, she made her way through the gate to the churchyard, and so to the church door. The November air was mild and damp. Clouds scudded across the sky with patches of blue here and there. Inside, the church was dark and cold, it was unheated except at service times. Brrrrrh, said Bunch expressively. I'd better get on with this quickly. I don't want to die of cold. With the quickness born of practice she collected the necessary paraphernalia, vases, water, flower holders. I wish we had lilies, thought Bunch to herself. I get so tired of these scraggy chrysanthemums. Her nimble fingers arranged the blooms in their holders. There was nothing particularly original or artistic about the decorations, for Bunch Harmon herself was neither original nor artistic, but it was a homely and pleasant arrangement. Carrying the vases carefully, Bunch stepped up the aisle and made her way towards the altar. As she did so the sun came out. It shone through the east window of somewhat crude colored glass, mostly blue and red, the gift of a wealthy Victorian churchgoer. The effect was almost startling in its sudden opulence. Like jewels, thought Bunch. Suddenly she stopped, staring ahead of her. On the chancel steps was a huddled dark form. Putting down the flowers carefully, Bunch went up to it and bent over it. It was a man lying there, huddled over on himself. Bunch knelt down by him and slowly, carefully, she turned him over. Her fingers went to his pulse, a pulse so feeble and fluttering that it told its own story, as did the almost greenish pallor of his face. There was no doubt, Bunch thought, that the man was dying. He was a man of about 45, dressed in a dark, shabby suit. She laid down the limp hand she had picked up and looked at his other hand. This seemed clenched like a fist on his breast. Looking more closely she saw that the fingers were closed over what seemed to be a large wad or handkerchief which he was holding tightly to his chest. All round the clenched hand there were splashes of a dry brown fluid which, Bunch guessed, was dry blood. Bunch sat back on her heels, frowning. Up till now the man's eyes had been closed but at this point they suddenly opened and fixed themselves on Bunch's face. They were neither dazed nor wandering. They seemed fully alive and intelligent. His lips moved, and Bunch bent forward to catch the words, or rather the word. It was only one word that he said. Sanctuary. There was, she thought, just a very faint smile as he breathed out this word. There was no mistaking it, for after a moment he said it again, Sanctuary. Then, with a faint, long drawn out sigh, his eyes closed again. Once more Bunch's fingers went to his pulse. It was still there, but fainter now and more intermittent. She got up with decision. Don't move, she said, or try to move. I'm going for help. The man's eyes opened again but he seemed now to be fixing his attention on the colored light that came through the east window. He murmured something that Bunch could not quite catch. She thought, startled, that it might have been her husband's name. Julian, she said. Did you come here to find Julian? But there was no answer. 
The man lay with eyes closed, his breathing coming in slow, shallow fashion. Bunch turned and left the church rapidly. She glanced at her watch and nodded with some satisfaction. Dr. Griffiths would still be in his surgery. It was only a couple of minutes walk from the church. She went in, without waiting to knock or ring, passing through the waiting room and into the doctor's surgery. You must come at once, said Bunch. There's a man dying in the church. Some minutes later Dr. Griffiths rose from his knees after a brief examination. Can we move him from here into the vicarage? I can attend to him better there, not that it's any use. Of course, said Bunch. I'll go along and get things ready. I'll get Harper and Jones, shall I? To help you carry him. Thanks. I can telephone from the vicarage for an ambulance, but I'm afraid, by the time it comes. He left the remark unfinished. Bunch said, internal bleeding. Dr. Griffiths nodded. He said, how on earth did he come here? I think he must have been here all night, said Bunch, considering. Harper unlocks the church in the morning as he goes to work, but he doesn't usually come in. It was about five minutes later when Dr. Griffiths put down the telephone receiver and came back into the morning room where the injured man was lying on quickly arranged blankets on the sofa. Bunch was moving a basin of water and clearing up after the doctor's examination. Well, that's that, said Griffiths. I've sent for an ambulance and I've notified the police. He stood, frowning, looking down on the patient who lay with closed eyes. His left hand was plucking in a nervous, spasmodic way at his side. He was shot, said Griffiths. Shot at fairly close quarters. He rolled his handkerchief up into a ball and plugged the wound with it so as to stop the bleeding. Could he have gone far after that happened? Bunch asked. Oh, yes, it's quite possible. A mortally wounded man has been known to pick himself up and walk along a street as though nothing had happened, and then suddenly collapse five or ten minutes later. So he needn't have been shot in the church. Oh no. He may have been shot some distance away. Of course, he may have shot himself and then dropped the revolver and staggered blindly towards the church. I don't quite know why he made for the church and not for the vicarage. Oh, I know that said Bunch. He said it, Sanctuary. The doctor stared at her. Sanctuary. Here's Julian, said Bunch, turning her head as she heard her husband's steps in the hall. Julian. Come here. The Reverend Julian Harmon entered the room. His vague, scholarly manner always made him appear much older than he really was. Dear me, said Julian Harmon, staring in a mild, puzzled manner at the surgical appliances and the prone figure on the sofa. Bunch explained with her usual economy of words. He was in the church, dying. He'd been shot. Do you know him, Julian? I thought he said your name. The vicar came up to the sofa and looked down at the dying man. Poor fellow, he said, and shook his head. No, I don't know him. I'm almost sure I've never seen him before. At that moment the dying man's eyes opened once more. They went from the doctor to Julian Harmon and from him to his wife. The eyes stayed there, staring into Bunch's face. Griffith stepped forward. If you could tell us, he said urgently. But with eyes fixed on Bunch, the man said in a weak voice, please, please and then, with a slight tremor, he died. Sergeant Hayes licked his pencil and turned the page of his notebook. So that's all you can tell me, Mrs. Harmon. That's all, said Bunch. These are the things out of his coat pockets. On a table at Sergeant Hayes's elbow was a wallet, a rather battered old watch with the initials WS and the return half of a ticket to London. Nothing more. You found out who he is, asked Bunch. AMR and Mrs. Ecclesiastes phoned up the station. He's her brother, it seems.
Name of Sandborn. Been in a low state of health and nerves for some time. He's been getting worse lately. The day before yesterday he walked out and didn't come back. He took a revolver with him. And he came out here and shot himself with it, said Bunch. Why? Well, you see, he'd been depressed. Bunch interrupted him. I don't mean that. I mean, why here? Since Sergeant Hayes obviously did not know the answer to that one, he replied in an oblique fashion, come out here, he did, on the 510 bus. Yes, said Bunch again. But why? I don't know, Mrs. Harmon, said Sergeant Hayes. There's no accounting. If the balance of the mind is disturbed. Bunch finished for him. They may do it anywhere. But it still seems to me unnecessary to take a bus out to a small country place like this. He didn't know anyone here, did he? Not so far as can be ascertained, said Sergeant Hayes. He coughed in an apologetic manner and said, as he rose to his feet, it may be as Mr. and Mrs. Ecclesiastes will come out and see you, ma'am, if you don't mind, that is. Of course I don't mind, said Bunch. It's very natural. I only wish I had something to tell them. I'll be getting along, said Sergeant Hayes. I'm only so thankful, said Bunch, going with him to the front door, that it wasn't murder. A car had driven up at the vicarage gate. Sergeant Hayes, glancing at it, remarked, looks as though that's Mr. and Mrs. Ecclesiastes come here now, ma'am, to talk with you. Bunch braced herself to endure what, she felt, might be rather a difficult ordeal. However, she thought, I can always call Julian to help me. A clergyman's a great help when people are bereaved. Exactly what she had expected Mr. and Mrs. Ecclesiastes to be like, Bunch could not have said, but she was conscious, as she greeted them, of a feeling of surprise. Mr. Ecclesiastes was a stout florid man whose natural manner would have been cheerful and facetious. Mrs. Ecclesiastes had a vaguely flashy look about her. She had a small, mean, pursed-up mouth. Her voice was thin and reedy. It's been a terrible shock, Mrs. Harmon, as you can imagine, she said. Oh, I know, said Bunch. It must have been. Do sit down. Can I offer you, well, perhaps it's a little early for tea. Mr. Ecclesiastes waved a pudgy hand. No, no, nothing for us, he said. It's very kind of you, I'm sure. Just wanted to, well, what poor William said and all that, you know. He's been abroad a long time, said Mrs. Ecclesiastes, and I think he must have had some very nasty experiences. Very quiet and depressed he's been, ever since he came home. Said the world wasn't fit to live in and there was nothing to look forward to. Poor Bill, he was always moody. Bunch stared at them both for a moment or two without speaking. Pinched my husband's revolver, he did, went on Mrs. Ecclesiastes without our knowing. Then it seems he come here by bus. I suppose that was nice feeling on his part. He wouldn't have liked to do it in our house. Poor fellow, poor fellow, said Mr. Ecclesiastes, with a sigh. It doesn't do to judge. There was another short pause, and Mr. Ecclesiastes said, Did he leave a message? Any last words, nothing like that. His bright, rather pig-like eyes watched Bunch closely. Mrs. Ecclesiastes, too leaned forward as though anxious for the reply. No, said Bunch quietly. He came into the church when he was dying, for sanctuary. Mrs. Ecclesiastes said in a puzzled voice. Sanctuary? I don't think I quite. Mr. Ecclesiastes interrupted. Holy place, my dear, he said impatiently. That's what the vicar's wife means. It's a sin, suicide, you know. I expect he wanted to make amends.
He tried to say something just before he died, said Bunch. He began, please, but that's as far as he got. Mrs. Ecclesiastes put her handkerchief to her eyes and sniffed. Oh, dear, she said. It's terribly upsetting, isn't it? There, there, Pam, said her husband. Don't take on. These things can't be helped. Poor Willie. Still, he's at peace now. Well, thank you very much, Mrs. Harmon. I hope we haven't interrupted you. A vicar's wife is a busy lady, we know that. They shook hands with her. Then Ecclesiastes turned back suddenly to say, Oh yes, there's just one other thing. I think you've got his coat here, haven't you? His coat. Bunch frowned. Mrs. Ecclesiastes said, We'd like all his things, you know. Sentimental like. He had a watch and a wallet and a railway ticket in the pockets, said Bunch. I gave them to Sergeant Hayes. That's all right, then, said Mr. Ecclesiastes he'll hand them over to us, I expect. His private papers would be in the wallet. There was a pound note in the wallet, said Bunch. Nothing else. No letters. Nothing like that. Bunch shook her head. Well, thank you again, Mrs. Harmon. The coat he was wearing, perhaps the sergeant's got that too, has he? Bunch frowned in an effort of remembrance. No, she said. I don't think, let me see. The doctor and I took his coat off to examine his wound. She looked round the room vaguely. I must have taken it upstairs with the towels and basin. I wonder now, Mrs. Harmon, if you don't mind. We'd like his coat, you know, the last thing he wore. Well, the wife feels rather sentimental about it. Of course, said Bunch. Would you like me to have it cleaned first? I'm afraid it's rather, well, stained. Oh, no, 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 that doesn't matter. Bunch frowned. Now I wonder where, excuse me a moment. She went upstairs and it was some few minutes before she returned. I'm so sorry, she said breathlessly, my daily woman must have put it aside with other clothes that were going to the cleaners. It's taken me quite a long time to find it. Here it is. I'll do it up for you in brown paper. Disclaiming their protests she did so, then once more effusively bidding her farewell the Ecclesias departed. Bunch went slowly back across the hall and entered the study. The Reverend Julian Harmon looked up and his brow cleared. He was composing a sermon and was fearing that he'd been led astray by the interest of the political relations between Judea and Persia, in the reign of Cyrus. Yes, dear, he said hopefully. Julian, said Bunch. What sanctuary exactly? Julian Harmon gratefully put aside his sermon paper. Well, he said. Sanctuary in Roman and Greek temples applied to the cella in which stood the statue of a god. The Latin word for altar era also means protection. He continued learnedly, in 399 AD the right of sanctuary in Christian churches was finally and definitely recognized. The earliest mention of the right of sanctuary in England is in the Code of Laws issued by Ethelbert in AD 600. He continued for some time with his exposition but was, as often, disconcerted by his wife's reception of his erudite pronouncement. Darling, she said. You are sweet. Bending over, she kissed him on the tip of his nose. Julian felt rather like a dog who has been congratulated on performing a clever trick. The Ecclesias have been here, said Bunch. The vicar frowned. The Ecclesias? I don't seem to remember. You don't know them. They're the sister and her husband of the man in the church. My dear, you ought to have called me. There wasn't any need, said Bunch. They were not in need of consolation. I wonder now. She frowned. If I put a casserole in the oven tomorrow, can you manage, Julian?
I think I shall go up to London for the sales. The sales. Her husband looked at her blankly. Do you mean a yacht or a boat or something? Bunch laughed. No, darling. There's a special white sail at Burroughs and Portman's. You know, sheets, tablecloths and towels and glass cloths. I don't know what we do with our glass cloths, the way they wear through. Besides, she added thoughtfully, I think I ought to go and see Aunt Jane. That sweet old lady, Miss Jane Marple, was enjoying the delights of the metropolis for a fortnight, comfortably installed in her nephew's studio flat. So kind of dear Raymond, she murmured. He and Joan have gone to America for a fortnight and they insisted I should come up here and enjoy myself. And now, dear Bunch, do tell me what it is that's worrying you. Bunch was Miss Marple's favorite godchild, and the old lady looked at her with great affection as Bunch, thrusting her best felt hat further on the back of her head, started on her story. Bunch's recital was concise and clear. Miss Marple nodded her head as Bunch finished. I see, she said. Yes, I see. That's why I felt I had to see you, said Bunch. You see, not being clever. But you are clever, my dear. No, I'm not. Not clever like Julian. Julian, of course, has a very solid intellect, said Miss Marple. That's it, said Bunch. Julian's got the intellect, but on the other hand, I've got the sense. You have a lot of common sense, Bunch, and you're very intelligent. You see, I don't really know why I ought to do. I can't ask Julian because, well, I mean, Julian's so full of rectitude. This statement appeared to be perfectly understood by Miss Marple, who said, I know what you mean, dear. We women, well, it's different. She went on, you told me what happened, Bunch but I'd like to know first exactly what you think. It's all wrong, said Bunch. The man who was there in the church, dying, knew all about sanctuary. He said it just the way Julian would have said it. I hear he was a well-read, educated man. And if he'd shot bit, self, he wouldn't drag himself into a church afterward and say sanctuary. Sanctuary means that you're pursued, arid when you get into a Church you're safe. Your pursuers can't touch you. At one time even the law couldn't get at you. She looked questioningly at Miss Marple. The latter nodded. Bunch went on, those people, the Ecclesiastes, were quite different. That watch, the dead man's watch. It had the initials WS on the back of it. But inside, I opened it, in very small lettering there was to Walter from his father and a date. But the Ecclesiastes kept talking of him as William or Bill. Miss Marple seemed about to speak but Bunch rushed on, Oh, I know you're not always called the name you're baptized by. I mean, I can understand that you might be christened William and called Porky or Carrots or something. But your sister wouldn't call you William or Bill if your name was Walter. You mean that she wasn't his sister? I'm quite sure she wasn't his sister. They were horrid, both of them. They came to the vicarage to get his things and to find out if he'd said anything before he died. When I said he hadn't I saw it in their faces, relief. I think, myself, finished Bunch, it was Ecclesiastes who shot him. Murder, said Miss Marple. Yes, said Bunch, murder. That s why I came to you darling. Bunch's remark might have seemed incongruous to an ignorant listener, but in certain spheres Miss Marple had a reputation for dealing with murder. He said please to me before he died, said Bunch. He wanted me to do something for him. The awful thing is I've no idea what. Miss Marple considered for a moment or two and then pounced on the point that had already occurred to Bunch. But why was he there at all, she asked. You mean, said Bunch, if you wanted sanctuary, you might pop into a church anywhere.
T here s no need to take a bus that only goes four times a day and come out to a lonely spot like ours for it. He must have come there for a purpose, Miss Marple thought. He must have come to see someone. Chipping Clayhorn's not a big place, Bunch. Surely you must have some idea of who it was he came to see. Bunch reviewed the inhabitants of her village in her mind before rather doubtfully shaking her head. In a way, she said, it could be anybody. He never mentioned a name. He said Julian, or I thought he said Julian. It might have been Julia, I suppose. As far as I know, there isn't any Julia living in Chipping Clayhorn. She screwed up her eyes as she thought back to the scene. The man lying there on the chancel steps, the light coming through the window with its jewels of red and blue. Light. Jewels, said Bunch suddenly. Perhaps that's what he said. The light coming through the east window looked like jewels. Jewels, said Miss Marple thoughtfully. I'm coming now, said Bunch, to the most important thing of all. The reason why I've really come here today. You see, the Ecclesiastes made a great fuss about having his coat. We took it off when the doctor was seeing to him. It was an old, shabby sort of coat, there was no reason they should have wanted it. They pretended it was sentimental, but that was nonsense. Anyway, I went up to find it, and as I was going up the stairs I remembered how he'd made a kind of picking gesture with his hand, as though he was fumbling with the coat. So. When I got hold of the coat I looked at it very carefully and I saw that in one place the lining had been sewn up again with a different thread. So I unpicked it and found a little piece of paper inside. I took it out and sewed it up again properly with thread that matched. I was careful and I don't really think that the Ecclesiastes would know I've done it. I don't think so, but I can't be sure. And I took the coat down to them and made some excuse for the delay. The piece of paper, asked Miss Marple. Bunch opened her handbag. I didn't show it to Julian, she said, because he would have said that I ought to have given it to the Ecclesiastes. But I thought I'd rather bring it to you instead. A cloakroom ticket, said Miss Marple, looking at it. Paddington Station. He had a return ticket to Paddington in his pocket, said Bunch. The eyes of the two women met. This calls for action, said Miss Marple briskly. But it would be advisable, I think, to be careful. Would you have noticed at all, Bunch dear, whether you were followed when you came to London today? Followed, exclaimed Bunch. You don't think? Well, I think it's possible, said Miss Marple. When anything is possible, I think we ought to take precautions. She rose with a brisk movement. You came up here ostensibly, my dear, to go to the sales. I think the right thing to do, therefore, would be for us to go to the sales. But before we set out, we might put one or two little arrangements in hand. I don't suppose, Miss Marple added obscurely, that I shall need the old speckled tweed with the beaver collar just at present. It was about an hour and a half later that the two ladies, rather the worse for wear and battered in appearance, and both clasping parcels of hard-won household linen, sat down at a small and sequestered hostelry called the Apple Bow to restore their forces with steak and kidney pudding followed by apple tart and custard. Really a pre-war quality face towel, gasped Miss Marple, slightly out of breath. With AJ on it too. So fortunate that Raymond's wife's name is Joan. I shall put them aside until I really need them and then they will do for her if I pass on sooner than I expect. I really did need the glass cloths, said Bunch. And they were very cheap, though not as cheap as the ones that woman with the ginger hair managed to snatch from me. A smart young woman with a lavish application of rouge and lipstick entered the apple bow at that moment. After looking round vaguely for a moment or two, she hurried to their table. She laid down an envelope by Miss Marple's elbow. There you are, Miss, she said briskly. Oh, thank you, Gladys, said Miss Marple. Thank you very much. So kind of you. 
Always pleased to oblige, I'm sure, said Gladys. Ernie always says to me, everything what's good you learned from that Miss Marple of yours that you were in service with, and I'm sure I'm always glad to oblige you, Miss. Such a dear girl, said Miss Marple as Gladys departed again. Always so willing and so kind. She looked inside the envelope and then passed it on to Bunch. Now be very careful, dear, she said. By the way, is there still that nice young inspector at Melchester that I remember? I don't know, said Bunch. I expect so. Well, if not, said Miss Marple thoughtfully, I can always ring up the chief constable. I think he would remember me. Of course he'd remember you, said Bunch. Everybody would remember you. You're quite unique. She rose. Arrived at Paddington, Bunch went to the parcels office and produced the cloakroom ticket. A moment or two later a rather shabby old suitcase was passed across to her, and carrying this, she made her way to the platform. The journey home was uneventful. Bunch rose as the train approached Chipping Cleghorn and picked up the old suitcase. She had just left her carriage when a man, sprinting along the platform, suddenly seized the suitcase from her hand and rushed off with it. Stop! Bunch yelled. Stop him, stop him. He's taken my suitcase. The ticket collector who, at this rural station, was a man of somewhat slow processes had just begun to say, now, look here, you can't do that when a smart blow in the chest pushed him aside, and the man with the suitcase rushed out from the station. He made his way toward a waiting car. Tossing the suitcase in, he was about to climb after it, but before he could move a hand fell on his shoulder, and the voice of police constable Abel said, Now then, what's all this? Bunch arrived, panting, from the station. He snatched my suitcase, she said. Nonsense, said the man. I don't know what this lady means. It's my suitcase. I just got out of the train with it. Now, let's get this clear, said police constable Abel. He looked at Bunch with a bovine and impartial stare. Nobody would have guessed that police constable Abel and Mrs. Harmon spent long half hours in police constable Abel's off time discussing the respective merits of manure and bone meal for rose bushes. You say, madam, that this is your suitcase, said police constable Abel. Yes, said Bunch. Definitely. And you, sir. I say the suitcase is mine. The man was tall, dark, and well dressed with a drawling voice and a superior manner. A feminine voice from inside the car said, Of course it's your suitcase, Edwin. I don't know what this woman means. We'll have to get this clear, said Police Constable Abel. If it's your suitcase, madam, what do you say is inside it? Clothes, said Bunch. A long speckled coat with a beaver collar, two wool jumpers, and a pair of shoes. Well, that's clear enough, said Police Constable Abel. He turned to the other. I am a theatrical costumer, said the dark man importantly. This suitcase contains theatrical properties which I brought down here for an amateur performance. Right, sir, said Police Constable Abel. Well, we'll just look inside, shall we, and see? We can go along to the police station, or if you're in a hurry, we'll take the suitcase back to the station and open it there. It'll suit me, said the dark man. My name is Moss, by the way. Edwin Moss. The police constable, holding the suitcase, went back into the station. Just taking this into the parcel's office, George, he said to the ticket collector. Police Constable Abel laid the suitcase on the counter of the parcel's office and pushed back the clasp. The case was not locked. Bunch and Mr. Edwin Moss stood on either side of him, their eyes regarding each other vengefully. Ah, said Police Constable Abel, as he pushed up the lid. Inside, neatly folded, was a long, rather shabby tweed coat with a beaver fur collar.
there were also two wool jumpers and a pair of country shoes. Exactly as you say, madam, said Police Constable Abel, turning to Bunch. Nobody could have said that Mr. Edwin Moss underdid things. His dismay and compunction were magnificent. I do apologize, he said. I really do apologize. Please believe me, dear lady, when I tell you how very, very sorry I am. Unpardonable, quite unpardonable, my behavior has been. He looked at his watch. I must rush now. Probably my suitcase has gone on the train. Raising his hat once more, he said meltingly to Bunch, do, do forgive me, and rushed hurriedly out of the parcel's office. Are you going to let him get away, asked Bunch in a conspiratorial whisper to Police Constable Abel. The latter slowly closed a bovine eye in a wink. He won't get too far, ma'am, he said. That's to say, he won't get far unobserved, if you take my meaning. Oh, said Bunch, relieved. That old lady's been on the phone, said Police Constable Abel, the one as was down here a few years ago. Bright she is, isn't she? But there's been a lot cooking up all today. Shouldn't wonder if the inspector or sergeant was out to see you about it tomorrow morning. It was the inspector who came, the inspector Craddock whom Miss Marple remembered. He greeted Bunch with a smile as an old friend. Crime in Chipping Cleghorn again, he said cheerfully. You don't lack for sensation here, do you, Mrs. Harmon? I could do with rather less, said Bunch. Have you come to ask me questions or are you going to tell me things for a change? I eleven tell you some things first, said the inspector. To begin with, Mr. and Mrs. Ecclesiastes have been having an eye kept on them for some time. There's reason to believe they've been connected with several robberies in this part of the world. For another thing, although Mrs. Ecclesiastes has a brother called Sandborn who has recently come back from abroad, the man you found dying in the church yesterday was definitely not Sandborn. I knew that he wasn't, said Bunch. His name, was Walter, to begin with, not William. The inspector nodded. His name was Walter St. John, and he escaped 48 hours ago from Charrington Prison. Of course, said Bunch softly to herself, he was being hunted down by the law, and he took sanctuary. Then she asked, what had he done? I eleven have to go back rather a long way. It's a complicated story. Several years ago there was a certain dancer doing turns at the music halls. I don't expect you'll have ever heard of her, but she specialized in an Arabian Nights turn. Aladdin in the Cave of Jewels, it was called. She wasn't much of a dancer, I believe, but she was, well, attractive. Anyway, a certain Asiatic royalty fell for her in a big way. Among other things he gave her a very magnificent emerald necklace. The historic jewels of a Raja, murmured Bunch ecstatically. Inspector Craddock coughed. Well, a rather more modern version, Mrs. Harmon. The affair didn't last very long, broke up when our potentate's attention was captured by a certain film star whose demands were not quite so modest. Zobeda, to give the dancer her stage name, hung onto the necklace, and in due course it was stolen. It disappeared from her dressing room at the theater, and there was a lingering suspicion in the minds of the authorities that she herself might have engineered its disappearance. Such things have been known as a publicity stunt, or indeed from more dishonest motives. The necklace was never recovered, but during the course of the investigation the attention of the police was drawn to this man, Walter St. John. He was a man of education and breeding who had come down in the world and who was employed as a working jeweler with a rather obscure firm which was suspected as acting as a fence for jewel robberies. There was evidence that this necklace had passed through his hands. It was, however, in connection with the theft of some other jeweler that he was finally brought to trial and convicted and sent to prison. He had not very much longer to serve so his escape was rather a surprise. But why did he come here, asked Bunch. Following up his trail, 
it seems that he went first to London. He didn't visit any of his old associates, but he visited an elderly woman, a Mrs. Jacobs who had formerly been a theatrical dresser. She won't say a word of what he came for, but according to other lodgers in the house, he left carrying a suitcase. I see, said Bunch. He left it in the cloakroom at Paddington and then he came down here. By that time, said Inspector Craddock, Ecclesiastes and the man who calls himself Edwin Moss were on his trail. They wanted that suitcase. They saw him get on the bus. They must have driven out in a car ahead of him and been waiting for him when he left the bus. And he was murdered, said Bunch. Yes, said Craddock. He was shot. It was Ecclesiastes's revolver, but I rather fancy it was Moss who did the shooting. Now, Mrs. Harmon, what we want to know is, where is the suitcase that Walter St. John actually deposited at Paddington Station? Bunch grinned. I expect Aunt Jane's got it by now, she said. Miss Marple, I mean. That was her plan. She sent a former maid of hers with a suitcase packed with her things to the cloakroom at Paddington and we exchanged tickets. I collected her suitcase and brought it down by train. She seemed to expect that an attempt would be made to get it from me. It was Inspector Craddock's turn to grin. So she said when she rang up. I'm driving up to London to see her. Do you want to come, too, Mrs. Harmon? Well, said Bunch, considering, W.E.L. 1, as a matter of fact, it's very fortunate. I had a toothache last night, so I really ought to go to London to see the dentist, Autun T.I. Definitely, said Inspector Craddock. Miss Marple looked from Inspector Craddock's face to the eager face of Bunch Harmon. The suitcase lay on the table. Of course, I haven't opened it, the old lady said. I wouldn't dream of doing such a thing till somebody official arrived. Besides, she added, with a demurely mischievous Victorian smile, it's locked. Like to make a guess at what's inside, Miss Marple, asked the inspector. I should imagine, you know, said Miss Marple, that it would be Zobeda's theatrical costumes. Would you like a chisel, Inspector? The chisel soon did its work. Both women gave a slight gasp as the lid flew up. The sunlight coming through the window lit up what seemed like an inexhaustible treasure of sparkling jewels, red, blue, green, orange. Aladdin's cave, said Miss Marple. The flashing jewels the girl wore to dance. Ah, said Inspector Craddock. Now, What's so precious about it, do you think, that a man was murdered to get hold of it? She was a shrewd girl, I expect, said Miss Marple thoughtfully. She's dead, isn't she, Inspector? Yes, died three years ago. She had this valuable emerald necklace, said Miss Marple musingly. Had the stones taken out of their setting and fastened here and there on her theatrical costume, where everyone would take them for merely colored rhinestones. Then she had a replica made of the real necklace, and that, of course, was what was stolen. No wonder it never came on the market. The thief soon discovered the stones were false. Here is an envelope, said Bunch, pulling aside some of the glittering stones. Inspector Craddock took it from her and extracted two official-looking papers from it. He read aloud, Marriage certificate between Walter Edmund St. John and Mary Moss. That was Zobeda's real name. So they were married, said Miss Marple. I see. What's the other, asked Bunch. A birth certificate of a daughter, Jewel. Jewel, cried Bunch. Why, of course. Jewel. Jill. That's it. I see now why he came to Chipping Cleghorn. That's what he was trying to say to me. Jewel. The Mundys, you know. La Banam Cottage. They look after a little girl for someone. They're devoted to her. She's been like their own granddaughter. Yes, I remember now, her name is Jewel, only, of course, they call her Jill.
MRS Mundy had a stroke about a week ago, and the old man's been very ill with pneumonia. They were both going to go to the infirmary. I've been trying, hard to find a good home for Jill somewhere. I didn't want her taken away to an institution. I suppose her father heard about it in prison and he managed to break away and get hold of the suitcase from the old dresser he or his wife left it with. I suppose if the jewels really belong to her mother, they can be used for the child now. I should imagine so, Mrs. Harmon. If they're here. Oh, they'll be here all right, said Miss Marple cheerfully. Thank goodness you're back, dear, said the Reverend Julian Harmon, greeting his wife with affection and a sigh of content. M.R.S. Bert always tries to do her best when you're away, but she really gave me some very peculiar fish cakes for lunch. I didn't want to hurt her feelings so I gave them to Tiglash Pileser, but even he wouldn't eat them, so I had to throw them out of the window. Tiglash Pileser, said Bunch, stroking the vicarage cat, who was purring against her knee, is very particular about what fish he eats. I often tell him he's got a proud stomach. And your tooth, dear. Did you have it seen to? Yes, said Bunch. It didn't hurt much, and I went to see Aunt Jane again, too. Dear old thing, said Julian. I hope she's not failing at all. Not in the least, said Bunch, with a grin. The following morning Bunch took a fresh supply of chrysanthemums to the church. The sun was once more pouring through the east window, and Bunch stood in the jeweled light on the chancel steps. She said very softly under her breath, your little girl will be all right. I'll see that she is. I promise. Then she tidied up the church, slipped into a pew, and knelt for a few moments to say her prayers before returning to the vicarage to attack the piled-up chores of two neglected days. The End <laughs>